oh gosh, I have so much I want to ask you about, but maybe you could just talk to me a little bit about your background. And I wanted to also know specifically how, even in your education, you started to make the link between trauma and health. Like, why were you drawn to go to this disenfranchised part of San Francisco mm -hmm. and start a practice? So to answer your, your last question first, um, my, my family's from Jamaica. Hey, you know, I'm like the big, like I'm the immigrant, like, you know, big Jamaican family, the whole thing. And, um, and also, uh, my dad is super Catholic, uh, like super, super <laughs> Catholic. And so we were really raised in this way of like, you just give to the community, you know, like when you're from a small tribe, you, it's just everyone takes care of each other and looks out for each other. And I think especially the way that my dad raised us in terms of giving back to those who are least fortunate and that kind of stuff. I've always felt really connected to caring for underserved communities. And, and also like you can't grow up black in America and not feel outraged by uh, the terrible health disparities that are still going on you know, every day. And when we're talking about health disparities, we're talking about differences in, in like people living or dying, right? People losing their loved ones, kids having the opportunity to grow up and be healthy. Uh, and so that was the reason why I wanted to go and work in a really underserved neighborhood and why I went to Baby Hunter's Point. Because I will tell you, for me doing my training, like I did my um, residency at Stanford. And then before that, I did my master's in public health um, at Harvard. And it's like, that's who they need in the hood. You don't, you don't need, you don't need a, you know, like, a, like, like I will say, I'm sure your kids have a fantastic doctor, but I'm sure if they didn't, you would be an advocate and you would say, this doesn't seem right to me. And you would pursue and you would use, you know, influence and everything that you can as a mama bear to get what you need. And the, the people who need like the most amazing on it doctor are the people who, who don't have that, right? Who don't have the, can't, uh, don't have as much capacity or education or ability to advocate or power, social power or any of that stuff. And so that's why I wanted to go work in Hunter's Point. I just want to, before I get, I want to carry that thread through, but I just had a question um, about your dad. So, I, and this might be just out of left field, but how does one reconcile being a very strong Catholic and a scientist at the same time, a chemist, a doctor? Um, I think for my dad, it was like part and parcel. And um, he... So part of it was that he was, he went to a Jesuit high school and the Jesuit teaching is very much um, kind of, uh, you know, deep into the science and, and probing and testing and asking questions. And so his, his approach to science wasn't this like, it came down on high and that's the way that it is. It was very much like, look at the miracle of this molecule right and how amazing it is right like that was that's so it was very consistent his faith and his um scientific that's so interesting to me because i think you know i think part of the issue with society and i think it's been highlighted by this covid time is that you know we we're living in this age of of science where if it's not empirically provable it, it it can't exist it can't be true um which which also relates to your work and how you started to make connections you know without a huge data set to understand cause and effect and you're proving that now but i always wonder you know how when when physicians really have faith it seems like such an amazing mix of the two things you know because we have I, I think that lack of faith is what leads to hoarding toilet paper. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like the fear, this becomes the, the religion and 
And in a lot of ways, I think that our reliance on only science and not the God part, you know, causes a lot of that in, in our culture. I will say for me, one of the ways that it shows up for me is that um, science for me is, is an amazing tool that I feel like I apply in doing work that is to work to heal the world, right? Like science doesn't, doesn't I, I, so I'll tell you something crazy. I've never told anyone this before, but this is really funny. When I went to do my TED talk, um, and I know you're like, this is crazy. She's never told anybody she's telling Gwyneth Paltrow, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> but this is like, this is a really amazing conversation because when I went to do my TED talk, I was super nervous, crazy, crazy, crazy nervous. And literally my knees were knocking and like my legs were shaking. And I closed my eyes right before I got up. And I literally said, I said, Lord, if it is your will to let this message move through me and into the world, like let that happen right now. And it was really, it was very calming uh, for me. And, um, and I'm not like, I'm not like, like I don't go to church every Sunday. I'm not like the, the whatever, but I, I, for me, it was about a, like a higher purpose or a, a, or a deeper meaning, easing suffering in the world, uh, which I feel like is, it's as much a spiritual endeavor as it is a scientific endeavor. Wow. Yeah. Incredibly profound and beautiful. So I just started your book because I just got it when, and mm -hmm. um, I'm fascinated by it and I can't wait to finish it um, because I've always felt like the way we live our lives is in America, and, it, and maybe it's potentially different in other cultures, but that are the bad things that happen to us um, become a footnote, and we're not taught at the time how to process trauma. Um, and it's so incredible to see your observations around um, adverse childhood experiences and like actual health, heart health, asthma, et cetera. And so I did, and it's quite, I don't know, punk rock to start to put those things together and to create, you know, the science around childhood adversity and the effects of it. So did people think when you, when you started to, ideate this, were people, did you have resistance to this or were, did people, were they sort of nonplussed? Like what was the reaction of your, of your colleagues? It was the full range, right? There were, there were some people, um, there were some people who were like, that's really cute um, that you're doing this work and the science and the stress. For me, an interesting part of the story that I don't talk about a lot in the book, but it is um, really inextricably a part of my story is how, for me, race also plays a role, right? Yeah. Because when you're, when you're the only black person in like, <laughs> you know, your, your science class, at Berkeley that's got a thousand people in it, right? <laughs> right? Or when you're like, for me, I was, you know, one of a very, very small handful of black people in my medical school class. And what happened is that you kind of don't get the luxury of being, um, of being a goof off, right? Because people look at you and they see black people, right? And so you've probably heard this from your black friends where it's like, there's this sense of, of, a, a different level of excellence that's required. And so for me, that lesson came through when I first started learning about adverse childhood experiences and understanding that I was not only learning about the science and applying the science to heal my patients, but that I was also going out there and I had to represent it in the world 
when you ask the question of like, did people take it seriously? I mean, part of the thing that you'll experience in the in, in the book and part of the, that you'll just see, even for example, with my TED talk, is that my, my message always includes a blend of like real life, like, hey, this is how it shows up. This is what it looks and feels like. And I don't mess around when it comes to the science. Like, I'll tell you, I know my shit. <laughs> And so, and I'm not joking, like it really is. And so when people, and when people would say like, oh, that's not really a thing, right? Or that's not really scientific, or that's just, you know, that's just how life is, or it's just behavior, right? I would be like, actually, you know, individuals with higher risk of, you know, with higher doses of adversity have downregulated beta agonist receptor in their uh, pulmonary endothelium, right? And so someone who is- what you just said, but yes. Yeah, course. exactly, right? But someone who is a pulmonologist, I'm like, oh, that's your thing. Oh, you're, you're, you're an immunologist, you're, you're another doctor, you're a researcher, you're a head of a hospital, you're whoever. Like I'm gonna, I am going to know, not like have read it and kind of think of whatever, but I'm, there are so many people who have experienced such adversity, right? That they need me to know my shit and they need me to be able to, when I make the case that the full weight of the science is behind it. And so that is, it's a long answer to your, to your question, but the people received it in a whole bunch of different ways. And my response always to that is to uh, be extremely, extremely rigorous with the science. And as a result, what we've seen is that there have been a transformation. In the past decade, like we went from, I went from people being like, oh, you know, whatever, to California is implementing, you know, the, the, the largest initiative, uh, you know, ever in terms of training doctors on how to screen for and respond to childhood adversity. Is there, and this might be a weird question, but is there any sort of correlation between length or severity of trauma and susceptibility later in life to health, these health issues? Yeah, so the, the way that it works is the cumulative adversity is what impacts health. And I, I, um, the, the piece of it that's important is that it's a combination of the exposure, including you know, the length, the severe, severity, the duration, also the, the different types of trauma. So like when we talk about adverse childhood experiences, those include, there, there are 10 different categories, you know, physical, emotional, sexual abuse, physical, emotional neglect, growing up in a household where a parent was mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. Um, and so the more different, the interesting thing is what the data shows, when you look at an ACE score, for example, if someone has an ACE score of four, it means that they had experienced four of those categories. It doesn't say how severely or intensely or for how long, but it does give a good sense of like, if you are a child, you're growing up in a household and you experience both physical abuse and sexual abuse and neglect, and you had a parent who was depressed, like you get a sense of the, the, the day to day, the cumulative experience that your body has to absorb. Um, and so that's a really important component. But the other really important component is that we all have a different level of vulnerability, right? So it's just like height, right? Like some people, because of the way they're born, their family history, their genetics, you know, some people are four foot 11, some people are six foot five, right? And so some people, can experience really significant adversity and have um, and have less of a, a, a biological impact. And some people can even even with smaller doses of adversity have a really kind of right. outsized impact. So it's a, so it's a combination. Um, and then obviously the the other piece of the combination is the buffering, 
right? So if you experience moderate adversity, but you had lots of nurturing, oh my gosh, the data on this is awesome. So if you have this, this check that if you have four or more adverse childhood experiences, like your risk for certain health problems is like, you know, double as compared to someone who had zero. But then if you also had tons of buffering, right? You had loving parents who, who you, you had an adult who you always trusted and looked out for you. You felt loved, you felt cared for, all of that stuff that actually reduces the, the risk of the negative health outcome. Yeah, but by a lot, by like, you know, 50 to 60%. And what happens in the body when we experience stress that leads to this? Yeah, so when we experience stress, it activates our fight or flight response. And that happens in a couple of ways. It's a combination between our brain. So the amygdala in our brain activates the fear response. And then that triggers the release of all these stress hormones. And there are a whole lot of stress hormones, but the ones that we kind of, the ones that are most commonly known are adrenaline and cortisol, right? So we all know adrenaline, that's like, when you go skiing and you're, <laughs> right? And you're going really fast and your heart is pounding really hard. And you're like, ah, um, that's adrenaline. So adrenaline can be, you know, people talk about the adrenaline rush, right? Um, but, the, but what adrenaline does is it increases your blood pressure, your blood sugar, it shunts blood to your big muscles and, so that you can, you know, have, um, you, so you're, you know, you're literally like your muscles are you know slightly stronger, like they work uh, harder and more efficiently, um, and then uh, and then the other one is cortisol. So adrenaline is more of a short-term stress hormone, and the other one is cortisol, which is more of a long-term stress hormone. And if you think about what would trigger cortisol, it's kind of like um, historically you might think of something like famine, right, or drought. That is like back when we were running in the plains in Africa, right? Like that's the um, famine was a real major stressor. And so cortisol also raises your blood pressure, your blood sugar. Um, it actually can make you more, slightly more aggressive, right? Um, and it, interestingly, cortisol, tell me if this is too much, but it turns out that Almost every cell in your body has a receptor for cortisol, right? And part of the reason for that is because when cortisol is released, it is a signal to the body that you're experiencing a long-term stress. And so it's trying to mobilize your brain and body to be able to survive better in long-term stress. And so it can affect your immune system, right? When you activate your, your stress response, it also activates the immune response. It can affect your, um, uh, uh, for, like one of the things, it can make people a little bit more aggressive because if you're in the Serengeti and there is no food, if you're more aggressive than the next guy, you're more likely to survive, right? Um, and so it also inhibits the part of the brain that's responsible for like executive functioning, like judgment and impulse control and all of those things. And so these are, these are a lot of the effects that we see of stress on the body. It's on the brain, it's on our hormones, it's on our immune system, and then it's even on the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Because if you're experiencing these long-term stressors, you actually want the body to be able to adapt. And so uh, it affects what we call the epigenetic regulation, which is, it's not your genetic code, but it's the way your genetic code is, is expressed. So like, if you, think about, if you think about your DNA as musical, as like sheet music, or musical notes, um, epigenetic regulation is like the musical notations. It'll be like, hey, play that part again, or play it, you know, forte, or, <laughs> you know, or, you know, softer, like pianissimo, or whatever it is. Um, that's, um, and that's how our environment 
triggers the release of these hormones and these hormones change the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So if you compound childhood adversity and you're, you're in a more disenfranchised part of America and you're, you're like it touches on in your book, the area where you work was a toxic waste dump. I'm sure there aren't regulations around no metals in the water <laughs> the way that there should be in many parts of the country in there. So I, I would imagine it has a compounding effect on a lot of these things. Yeah, it's interesting. Many of, um, so the, the, the doctor who discovered the lead in the water in Flint is a good girlfriend of mine. And it's interesting that uh, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, and when many of the effects of lead poisoning are very similar to the effects of toxic stress, like the impact that it has on the brain uh, is very, very similar and actually some of the interventions that we do to help kids are really similar mm -hmm. um, as well. But you're, you're exactly right. But the interesting thing about it, and this is one point, is that the, the adverse childhood experience, a study, so this big research study done by the CDC and Kaiser, it, it wasn't done in a neighborhood like the one I served. It was done in Kaiser San Diego. Their population was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. And I think that was actually a really big eye opener because when you work in Hunter's Point, people expect it. Like people, you know, people look at the situation and say, oh, those folks have worse health outcomes. It's because they're, you know, they're poor or they are in poverty or whatever. But it turns out like rich white people that experience a lot of adversity also have really poor outcomes. It's just the biology of how adversity affects your, your body. And interesting that there are almost different, different constitutions weather it differently and survive better or have better outcomes. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on a combination of like supportive factors, right? So for example, some of the things that you might, it's number one, the total cumulative adversity because right. the 10, ACEs are um, the ones that they studied in the research study, right? But then if you have the adversity of discrimination, that's going to add to your cumulative adversity, right? Or if you have the adversity of, you know, your stress response is activated because you don't know whether you're going to pay rent or whether you're going to be evicted or because you're, you know, there's, there's violence on the street in the community, that adds to, adds to your cumulative adversity. So, so there's, there's a different differential exposure. And then there's also like the more resources you have in your community to support individuals, families, parents, kids, right? Like if you're in a neighborhood where you may be experiencing a ton of adversity in your home, right? But you go to school and your, your teachers are well supported and they're able to be that safe, stable, nurturing relationship for the kid, those kids are going to be better off. Right. But if you're in this under-resourced, underperforming, totally overtaxed school system, right, then it becomes much, again, like you're just taking away the, the opportunities for resilience and support. So my, I, I want to ask you, are there interventions or modality that can be applied after trauma to reverse some of these health effects from long-term childhood trauma? Do you mean immediately after or like long-term after? I mean long-term, like, yeah. you know, are there, are there ways that these children like can help reframe what happened to them and you know, experience the more connection or love they're able to experience, the more that they heal, and then the more that, or the less that they're at risk for some of these diseases? Yeah, so this is my favorite part of this work, right? So randomized controlled trials, they took kids where, um, they, they took kids who were um, institutionalized children, so they were in orphanages. Right, um, and they randomized them into either 
high quality nurturant care, right, within their orphanage, or care as usual, which is sad, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's sad to say that care as usual is like the opposite of high quality nurturing care. Right. And they did this when the kids were two years old and they, they did MRIs of their brain. And then they look at kids who were never institutionalized. And what they found was that the kids who were randomized into high quality nurturing caregiving, their brains, the brain structure on MRI looked like the kids who had never been institutionalized. Wow. Right? Like, so when we talk about safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments are healing for kids, we're not just talking about like, oh, it's so nice to have. It's actually what we see is we can see changes in brain structure and function. We can see changes in immune profile. We can see changes in the level of stress hormones. Um, and there are, there are a bunch of interventions. So one of the most important things with this whole process is recognizing what's going on to begin with. It's recognizing, oh my goodness, because of what you've experienced, your body may be making more stress hormones than it should. It can look and feel like this. How does it show up for you, right? So just recognizing that. And I found that for my patients, just that bit of information, like the number one answer that I get when I say that to my patients is, oh, you mean I'm not crazy? It's like, no, no, not at all, right? Like this is, this is actually the normal response for someone who's experienced what you've experienced, right? That is really powerful. And then recognizing, um, so then when we look at the evidence and like, you know, again, looked at thousands of research studies, some of the things that help to regulate stress hormones, because we, we now know what we're trying to target. We're trying to target the activation of the stress response, right? And so that includes, that includes you know, the healthy relationships, um, regular exercise, right? So exercise, the other thing that exercise does, and I feel like I'm, this is a physician heal thyself moment right now because <laughs> there's a lot of stress happening in my life uh, right now. Um, but exercise not only helps to metabolize stress hormones, but it also releases something called BDNF, which is brain derived neurotrophic factor. And it's like miracle grow for brain cells. It actually stimulates our ability to make new neural connections, right? And that's exactly what you want to do for someone who's had a history of adversity. So, so exercise, really important. R good sleep, sleep hygiene, really important because when we're sleeping, our stress response recalibrates itself. So like, you know, you notice when you don't sleep, like when you when you miss sleep a you feel kind of you feel in your body like it's a stressor you feel kind of worn out and it turns out that like your levels of cortisol and um your stress response resets itself when you're sleeping and so when you miss sleep it it your your stress response can be more regulated so sleep um nutrition is a really important one because it also, another important part of the way the stress response affects our health is that for folks who have a history of high doses of adversity, they have an increased likelihood of insulin resistance, right? right? So insulin is also part of this whole stress process. And so having, having um, a diet that is really limits refined carbohydrates um, to, to reduce that insulin spike is also an important part of um, a, a important part of a diet that can help to regulate the stress response. So exercise is really important, diet, nutrition. Are, are, there, are, there, are there anything, what else do you encourage your patients to do in terms of you know, I mean, what you said before, the naming of it sounds like that is such a relief, right? To have somebody name what's going on and just expose it. Do you think that shame plays a part in this? So, you know, if these things happen to you and you, you're carrying shame, 
do you think that the way that we that one relates to that kind of exposure in terms of shame and holding on to that can that be dispersed can that be healed yeah so that's um that's a really fascinating question i um i don't i i feel like i haven't thought about it specifically in that frame but i work a lot with mental health professionals like in my in um when i was when i was in my clinical practice before i came into this role in government i um you know we had these multidisciplinary teams and one of the things that we learn is is to your point very much so like um that being able to to name it and to recognize i think for a lot of people that um like this isn't their fault right like there's a lot that they can um i i think that a lot of people who have experienced um a history of adversity or significant aces uh when they come into when they're when they're experiencing now the symptoms of an overactive stress response uh a lot of people have been told that they're the problem right right uh or even they've told themselves that they're the problem and so i think that to have uh, especially to have you know a doctor or a scientist or a researcher say no 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 this is how the body responds to a history of adversity and and I, this is the important piece like and here are some things that you can do about it right so here's how you recognize it and then here is how you um here here are some ways that you can support yourself or the people that you love and i think that does go a very long way to reduce the shame and the stigma and to help people you know really direct their energy at the thing that's most important which is which is healing right which is like getting healthy you know but i think we saw like we saw that even with hiv in the 80s right with like gay men who were out had a better prognosis on the same you know anti retroviral drugs than than gay men with hiv who were not out because there's this level of shame and stigma and hiding that literally affects your biology right and it and it only further increases that that biological stress it's so fascinating and also i think you know really speaks to the power of being of feeling your feelings being connected in your body exploring them mining them giving yourself the space to process through things and that that ultimately can impact your your longevity the interesting thing about um this research is that i think and the thing that's really powerful for me is that i think that we've always known and recognized as a society that the that early adversity can increase your risk for mental health and behavioral disorders for depression or anxiety or substance dependence or suicidality right and that was was treated in a certain way because those are all outcomes that tend to be really stigmatized societally and then one of the things that i've observed with this research is that when you say oh when someone has four or more aces their risk for heart disease and stroke and cancer is double right those are no longer like those are no longer conditions that are conditions of of bad behavior per se right like when you're talking about for folks with two or more aces your risk for autoimmune disease right is is double then people have this different response to it and for me i think the other thing that happens is that it really broadens the tent of the 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 people who feel like this is something really important to to address you touched on sleep earlier and i know you know it's almost like an epidemic of sleeplessness in this country but what what can we do about sleeplessness do you have yeah um there's so there are a couple things that we recommend so number one it's like the basics of you know what's called sleep hygiene 
right? Which is going to bed and waking up at the same time every night. And it turns out that when you do that, your brain actually entrains, right? So your brain starts to release all those sleep inducing neurotransmitters at the same time and it, and it makes them more effective, right? So um, I am, I'm super religious about my sleep schedule. What? I am not Your a great time. sleeper. <laughs> uh, my bedtime for real is nine o'clock. That is no joke. Like, <laughs> Like, is that in bed TV or that's in bed lights out? That is in bed lights out. Like I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I get, I mean, I, I get up at five, but yeah. So my husband and I have four kids. So it means that a lot of, when the, the big boys, when they're up later, he's on the night shift because he's more of a night owl and I'm in the morning. You have four kids? That's incredible. Yeah. We have four boys, four boys. Pray for me. <laughs> But it is, um, so going to bed and waking up at the same time uh, is one thing that's really important. And then you talked about TV, like not having TV or devices at least 30 minutes before bedtime, you know, things like avoiding caffeine after noon and, or, you know, just being aware of how your diet also affects your sleep, right? And I think that for, um, those are some of like the mainstays of sleep hygiene. The other thing is making sure that your sleep environment is like a calm, cool, quiet environment. Those are the, you know, whatever, that's what they say, calm, cool, and quiet um, environment. And then for folks who really are struggling with sleep, I really recommend it's good to like talk to your doctor, right? Because your doctor might recommend something like melatonin or another sleep aid. I, I went, the, the nights that I can't sleep or, you know, I'm ha dealing with like perimenopausal stuff. So like there are certain nights now where I just have such a terrible time and it's torture, especially having- oh, wait. So what do you do? What do you do for yourself? I have breathing exercises that I try mm. to do and just sort of, I lie there and do of meditation, like, you know, I'll just picture, I'll start like at the crown of my head and sort of mm -hmm. fill my body with like a molten sort of energy liquid thing and do sort of vis visualizations like that. And that tends to help me a lot too. It's, that's so funny that you say that because I will say that I think that meditation for me is my most effective like sleep support. Like I do, I do a meditation before bed and it's, um, it's like a total relaxation meditation. What do you do? I do one. Um, so I did a neuroscience, um, retreat at Plum Village. Are you familiar with Plum Village in France? Mm -hmm. So Thich Nhat Hanh is like a, he's a Vietnamese monk and he, um, was, was, uh, a kind of, you know, global, did, did really amazing global work uh, around the Vietnam War and the whole thing. And, and then he started this monastery in France. He was exiled to France and he started this monastery in France um, where they do a lot of um, also like very academic, like, like neuroscience related work with mindfulness. Wow. And so I went there, I was speaking at a neuroscience and mindfulness conference last year and um and i downloaded their app it's the plum village app wow. and uh, so there was some uh a total relaxation um meditation that i practiced when i was there and then now i do it and it's it's really effective for me for myself and you do it every night i do i do it every night because you know like my job is kind of stressful right now yeah, i know <laughs> Yeah. How are you, are you going into the clinic? So since I took on the role of Surgeon General, I haven't, I had to give up my clinical practice, okay. um, which I hope to, you know, I, one day I want to get back into, the, that's my favorite part of being a doctor is seeing patients. Um, but, um, but for now, my work is around, um, yeah, being, being the Surgeon General of California. So rad, yeah, <laughs> affecting policy and, you know, you're helping all of those patients in a much more impactful way, I would imagine, you know, being able to. Well, I will say the thing that I'm most proud of is that we have, you know, stood up this 
initiative called ACES Aware in California, wow. where we are, you know, the first state in the nation where doctors now can get reimbursed, like they can get paid for screening for adverse childhood experiences. And then there's, but in order to get paid uh, for screening, they have to do training on trauma-informed care, mm. right? And so they have to get certified. And so we're, we're training our doctors in California about trauma-informed care. Like, can you, can you believe that this hasn't been a part of medicine? No, oh, I can't. And frankly, I want to say, like, I think that it's very, I think that it's very easy for, for folks to look at it and kind of um, maybe, you know, saying, oh, really trauma-informed care? Like, that's what the California Surgeon General is focused on. But it turns out that, like, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, you know, identified early adversity and trauma as being like a major, major, major health issue. Like if, if we can do better practice and better science, I think it has the opportunity to be one of the greatest medical advances of the 21st century is for, for all, you know, healthcare professionals to recognize and understand the role that stress and trauma plays in our health and then what we can do to help people be healthier and 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 live well. And amazing that the surgeon general, the first surgeon general of California, has this sort of consciousness going into you know from such an amazing place of of service and 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 looking at a, a human being in that holistic way. You know what has happened to them and and what is their emotional state. But so for. So for now, how much of your day is spent on coronavirus? A lot. So a lot, yeah. <laughs> um, but in a really interesting way, right? Because the ever, you know, everyone in health and human services, it's all hands on deck. Like this is a, an, an a, you know, a once in a generation experience that we're all experiencing right now with this COVID pandemic. And um, one of the things that I feel really fortunate about is that I, I actually, I think there are some folks in health and human services where they were working on a project and they've kind of had to drop it completely and just fully focus on COVID, getting enough ventilators, getting enough testing, getting which, which we've been working so hard to do. Um, I think I was really fortunate to be in the situation where I was able to look at a lot of the work I had been focused on in terms of the effect of stress and adversity in our health and recognize that um, that work is even more important now in the era of COVID, right? Because yeah. what we're seeing now is not just that everyone's experiencing stress. So we have to understand how stress affects our health and the impact of you know stress related chronic disease on like the impact of stress hormones on things like diabetes right because we've seen in other natural disasters right that there's higher rates of you know heart attacks and strokes and diabetes and all of these things related to just the stress of the experience that we're all going through so that was something that was really important it was it's even more important right now for doctors and healthcare providers to understand that and to, and to know what the best practices are and what the best evidence is. But the other piece is, um, the other piece is that adverse childhood experiences are going up, Yeah. right? So well, there's more right. domestic violence that's okay. happening right now. And this is what's so beautiful about your work. We need to go in and fix the, the systemic problems that cause, you know, this transgenerational harm from one parent to their child and on. There's like, we have to figure out a way to break that. So, yeah, I mean, that's exactly, that's exactly what my work is focused on, uh, even more so right now with COVID, because what we see, for example, is if you have an adult who had ACEs in their childhood, right? So then their more, their biology is what we call stress sensitized, which means that they're at greater risk of having um, 
at having a poor outcome, whether it's physical health, you know, mental health, behavioral health, with subsequent stressors, right? Because they may have an overactive stress response. So then you throw a stressor like a pandemic into the mix and you have folks who are at greater risk of having negative health outcomes, but then also greater risk of having negative you know, mental and behavioral health outcomes. And so with the stress, it's, it's literally like I'm, I'm looking, you can see, you can tr look, turn around and look at our society and you can see that everyone's stress hormones are pumping, yeah. right? And you can see that in our reactivity. And so with that, if you think about it, right, that executive functioning, that level of some of that, that difficulty with impulse control, difficulty with executive functioning for some people like anger, frustration, all of that is just increasing. And then you throw in someone has lost their job, a job that they desperately need, and they're trying to take care of their kids and they're at home. So this is, this is again, it's kind of taking a lot of the, the shame and the blame out of the equation and just recognize that everyone's at greater risk. And so if we can, if we can get that word out and help people understand that, yeah, your stress hormones are, are really pumping right now. And here are the things that make a difference. Sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, healthy relationships, right? That these things are actually really healing. And the, that feels like it's, it's so important and so urgent now more so than ever. How does one have go out and forge a healthy relationship if their model for love in the home was neglectful or abusive? So there's a couple ways to do that, but one of the most important ways is therapy, like you know, mental health, uh, talking to a mental health professional, and I and um, I think that there's there are different levels of receptiveness uh, to therapy, but I think a lot of the stigma is going, um, is less than it used to be. Um, but that is really, I think, an important way to do that is to, is to work with a professional because the, the, the thing that I um, tell, you know, when, I, when, I, when I've been in clinic with the, with the parents of my patients, one of the things is that to, I think people recognize that these things get handed down generation after generation, and it's not intentional, right? And so if you've experienced it, you're at much greater risk of handing it down to your kids. Right. And it's like any, it's honestly, it's like any genetic disease or any other health condition that if you get, you get care for it, if you get treatment, then you're less likely to hand it down to your kids, right? right? And I think I see a lot of parents doing things for to do to do by their kids when they they wouldn't have gotten that care for themselves that feels really powerful for me because i think the other piece of it uh, is that for a lot of people there's this notion that if i'm strong and i'm smart i can just overcome right mm -hmm. that i can sure i experienced these hard things in my childhood but if I, if I, if I'm tough enough, right, I can just get over it. And right. I think that the part of the thing that the science is showing us, right, is that, and, and, and for many people getting over it, what they mean is like, oh, I didn't have a, I didn't have an addiction or I didn't have a mental health problem or I didn't have a whatever. When, when in reality, you might have none of those things and, and end up with, you know, heart disease or autoimmune disease, right? So the point is that it's really important to get care. And then that dramatically reduces the risk of handing it down. I've always thought that, you know, you know that phrase in the Bible that the, the sins of the father, the child is responsible for the sins of the father. And it always was so confounding to me. And, or I don't know, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not really like a Bible. I understand you too, yeah. <laughs> But you, you probably know it better than I do, but that, that general thought and that um, what it, when I became a parent, I realized like, oh no, it's, it's our responsibility to heal 
whatever the sins of our parents were, if we can heal them, then we don't carry them and they don't become our sin and we don't pass it along. Yeah, that's exactly right. And um, and the, the, the powerful thing is that what the science and the research shows is that our, the, the work that we do to um, kind of change our relationship to some of these experiences and patterns in our families. And when we f- figure out how do we repair ourselves so that we can be that safe, stable, and nurturing relationship for our kids, right? It, it can literally change those epigenetic markers that I was talking about, L- literally. Like it can, li- so it's re- it, so things like that, where when we're talking about a parent who's had a history of um, ACEs or trauma, you know, going to therapy, they literally, their process of doing that so that they can then deliver those daily doses of buffering care to their children, literally changes their their kids, like DNA, right? Like, <laughs> so that is some powerful stuff. Um, and that's something that, uh, for me, as I approach this work, I approach this work from this incredibly hopeful um, and and really joyful uh, position because I'm like I not only do I know it can be done, I've seen it. I've seen it in in patient after patient in my clinic, and um, and to see a family who otherwise had really, really been struggling in these patterns that have been handed down generation after generation, and then help you know, arm them with the information to understand, oh, this is why I'm so reactive to stuff. This is why when I get triggered, I go from zero to 100, right? This is just my body, my biological stress response, and it's really strong, right? It's really, and, and, and here's what I can do about it. And then that's going to change not only my experience, but my child's life. And then down the line, like for generations, right? That's, that feels powerful. <laughs>